get this meeting started, huh? <laughs> Apologize for being a little bit late. Welcome to the Lancaster Neighborhood Vitalization Commission. Today is June 4th. Go ahead and start this meeting at 4.05 based upon my tardiness. Um, roll call, please. Certainly. Commissioner Harris? Here. Commissioner Hearns? Here. Commissioner Kiefer? Here. Commissioner Lawson? Commissioner Mohammed? Present. Vice Chair Moulton? Here. Chairman Derryberry? I'm here as well. We have a quorum. Thank you. I've uh, I have the, had the pleasure of spending all day in an in in office without any air conditioning, so I'm a little uh, I'm a little if I look a little little winded or a little hot, it's because I've been I'm dying. So, <laughs> nonetheless, uh, I'd like to start with an invocation. Um, uh, Commissioner Hearns, would you mind leading us in, in a, an invocation today? Thank you. Well, dear Lord, we just come before you today thanking you, Lord, for another day of life, uh, another day of mobility, another day of just being able to uh, execute the things that we've had to do today, Lord, and keeping us safe. And Lord, I, I ask, Father, that you would uh, join us in this meeting today, Lord God, that we would uh, make wise choices, wise decisions, and hear with clarity and uh, see with, with clarity of vision, oh God. And we just ask, Lord, that what we would do henceforth, Lord, would be pleasing to you and for the betterment of our community, Lord. And it is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, if everyone could please remain standing, play, uh, face the flag, put your hand over your heart, and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You, 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 you kids are so well behaved. I wish you could teach a thing or two to my, uh, my six-year-old. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and start with public business from the floor. This is the time for citizens who would like to address the Lancaster Neighborhood Vitalization Commission on any of the agendized items. To speak on these items, please complete a speaker card. Individual speakers are limited to three minutes each. Um, anyone would like to, anybody would like to speak anything? No speaker cards. Today? Okay, we'll move on to the consent calendar. Um, we have two items before us, um, the meeting minutes from April 2nd and also the meeting minutes from uh, May 7th, we can take them in conjunction or uh, one at a time, depending on uh, the motions made. I'll make a motion to um, accept the minutes from April 2nd and May 7th. Do I hear a second? I second. Okay. Um, all those in favor, um, go ahead and vote. We'll see what happens. Looks like it, it carries with one abstention. That's myself. I. Okay. Now we'll go ahead and move on to the presentations. So we have uh, Daddy's Daycare After School Program. So I believe it's is it, is it Walkie Jones? Welcome. Are you responsible for all these kids, sir? <laughs> <laughs> Well, welcome. Tell me, tell me, tell us about Daddy's daycare after school program. I think the is the mic on up there. Is it? Hello, testing. Perfect. All right, there you go. Um, I started about a year, two years ago, um, out of our basic daycare. Um, I start paying tithe to the kids, in the sense of whatever I made from my daycare. Off each kid, I would pay 10% and go out and find different activities that the kids can be involved with. Um, a couple of businesses right here off of Lancaster Boulevard that offers uh, music, dance, and drama. And uh, I eventually w fell and in, ran into the uh, owner of the Fight Factory. So I went to them, and I used to box for a few years, and I offered them my services of 
if I train your pro fighters and MMA fighters, would you take in my daycare kids? And they agreed. So I started training all their classes and training all their fighters, uh, sweating back and forth, trading a little blood uh, from getting in the ring with them. Um, so it wasn't just talk and showing them how to do it. Um, in a progress of, of, of over a year of training the fighters and helping out the gym, the owner of the gym came to me and said, hey, I'm looking to sell the gym. Would you be interested in, in coming in? Um, so a leap of faith, I sold my boat and sold my motorcycle and started it. Take your time. Take your time. But I wanted to make it bigger. So I actually I needed to enlarge my daycare. So I went through the steps of enlargement. Um, I went to CCRC, and there was a way of getting to a point where you could be exempt from licensing. A grant a letter explain to them the activities and the benefits that you will provide the kids and that and the the city. And they uh, damn. They denied me. Um So I figured another way of doing it, the long way, and I moved to a larger location where I can get a center, and that place wasn't right enough. So I started to actually get in place the things that they wanted me to put in place, such as um, tutoring from Akbar, um, more child development. Um, in a sense of life skills, coaching, um, more one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentorship. So what I did was the guys that worked for me inside the gym had to go and become mentors and take classes and continue throughout the year. And this is where we at. I'm at the gym. I own the Fight Factory off the Fight Off of um, Division. Um, and I take 10% of what CCRC pays me. Our DCS pays me, and I put them through the after-school program for mixed martial arts, our um, art, music, drama. It's very emotional to me because it's such a blessing actually to be here because it's a struggle. Mm. So I'm going to let all the bars take a second. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Akbar Archibald. I'll be one of the tutors at uh, Daddy's Daycare. Um, my daughter uh, goes to Daddy Daycare. I'm a single father. I've been raising her since she was five by myself. She's 12 now. Uh, she's been in martial arts since she was four. She's now a second degree brown belt in Kempo. Um, we lived in Europe for a year, and there uh, she took... Brazilian capoeira, mm. which is a Brazilian martial art. <clears throat> I moved back to the U.S. about a year ago, and uh, I was looking for a place for her to continue to train. And uh, out of all places, moving back from Europe, I wound up in Lancaster, so it's like a culture shock almost <laughs> from one extreme to the next. But um, <clears throat> uh, something that was important to me uh, for a place to train for my daughter uh, was the the culture of the gym and uh, who our trainer would be and uh, I happened to come across Fight Factory after checking a few places uh, in Lancaster uh, and this is where I met <clears throat> Waki. Uh, he seemed to be a, a upstanding man and I like his vision for what he was trying to do with the Fight Factory and, and Daddy's Daycare. 
um, after talking for a while and I told him some of my history, which is, um, you know, me being a single dad and, uh, uh, you know, I travel. Uh, I've been to, you know, a few countries and, um, you know, just different experiences from places that I've gone. And he thought it might be a good idea that I come in uh, on what he was doing and mentor and tutor the children that would be going to uh, the fight factory. <clears throat> um, the thing basically that I will be bringing to the table is, um, I guess, my life story, which is uh, coming up as a uh, without a father, uh, living in the inner city, also known as the ghetto, and uh, being able to make it out, basically. Uh, I received my paralegal certification back in 2000. I've been a bankruptcy paralegal for the past 13 years, a single dad for seven of those years. And uh, around 2000, uh, growing up, uh, I decided I wanted to start to travel. So uh, initially I, I went to Amsterdam and Holland, to Trinidad and Tobago in the West Indies, to Japan where I was in Osaka, Tokyo, and, Os and Kyoto. I went to Berlin. I lived in Prague for a year. Uh, I went to Rome. I took my daughter to Rome while I was over there. And uh, also to Cairo in Egypt. Um, when I was in Prague, I was an assistant director at an English, a private English school that taught English to the Czech children. Um, and I think there, that's where I realized like I, I had a, a, a natural love for children. Um, because I do truly believe they are our future. So it's kind of like my way of giving back uh, from a position where I really didn't have that opportunity coming up for something like the Fight Factory to provide something to uh, local children as far as uh, sports, mentoring, and things of that nature. Um, so I will be doing the tutoring as far as like whatever issues the children may have in their after-school homework and any kind of mentoring I can do. Uh, whether it be balancing a checkbook for some of the older children, uh, how to fill out a resume, um, how to apply for a job, how to dress for an interview, uh, other possibilities for uh, professions, because I think in today's society most of the uh, options seem like it's music or, or sports. So just to know that there's another, another way out. So I believe in what Waki is doing, and I'm glad to be a part of it, and I hope you guys support it. Question. Yes. What is the age range? Uh, I believe it's going to be from toddler up to. We have, we have kids from 5 to 13 on up. We will deal with kids of 16 maybe as well. So the cutoff is 16 yes. or under 18 or? Under 18. Under 18. And I, I, would, I would at that point, we would like to maybe set up something that we could actually, if we have older kids, we can work on that as well. And we don't want to shut that off at 18. Definitely. Okay, why don't you join us again at the microphone so we can grill you with some questions. <laughs> I wanted to come back up and see that I'm kind of going to cop myself a little bit. Good. Um, also, I, I had set up a, a bully program as well. I've actually gone to the schools and talked to the teachers uh, regarding kids that we train, that we don't want them to go out and start bullying or coming into the gym because they're being bullied. Mm. Um, and it's, it's opened up tremendously um, for kids to come and talk to a coach than running to their mom or dad or even a teacher. And that was the biggest question is why didn't you come to your dad and why didn't you mom, your mom or even the teacher? For whatever reason, coach is a really high standard in kids list. And so they come and they talk to us. Um, the confidence that the kids get out of the program is phenomenal. Um, I've watched my daughter. He's a, I'm a single father as well. Um, and my three kids. My, my son is seeing his mom in Arizona right now. But my daughter here and Haley. I watched my daughter progress into something wonderful. Where just a month ago we were going to school and we were getting ready to drop her off. And uh, she was a girl standing on the side of the street. And she said, Dad, that man is talking to that girl. And I turned to look and we're looking for a minute, and he says, yeah, she's talk he's talking to her. This man had to be about 45, 
um, the little girl was 12. And I'm reading my daughter, and I'm reading the little girl, and you can tell through the body language it was not a good situation. Um, I am continue watching the little girl and cross the street when the red light came. The little girl crossed the street. I waved her to my car and asked her, what was that man asking her? And she had said he was asking me, do I live close by here? Do, can I take you home? Mm -hmm. So I told her to go to school. I told my little daughter to get out of school, go, go get, get, out of the class, get out of the car and go to school. And I followed the man. Um, he went over, this was off of Chase, uh, off Division and, I'm sorry, off of Challenger and K. And he went over to that shell and he sat there and started watching more kids. So I called PD and PD was on their way and he started to get up to walk away. So I followed him. I had to get out of my car because I was worried about him hopping fences. So I followed him and uh, he walked all the way down to 15th Street East, made a left, walked all the way down to J. And that's when the police officers finally got there. And um, I explained to him what the young girl had told me, what school she went to. My daughter went to the same school. Maybe then my daughter could, I w couldn't identify the little girl. So it was only a brief moment of seeing her. But maybe my daughter might know her. And let's go back to the school and find her. So that's what we did. And within a few minutes of her sitting and talking, and I'm letting my daughter kind of, yeah, you know, go through the pictures and, and the police officers talk, talking to her. And she's describing the little girl and, you know, just saying what's going on, even with the man that she was talking to, he was, she was talking to. Um, I can see the confidence in my little girl that she was standing up and she was noticing things. So finally the little girl came to the office and told the principal what the, the man had said, and she was scared. She was scared standing there listening, and she was even more scared to go say anything. That would change an after-school program. Kids have so much confidence, it needs to be brought out. And for that little girl not to go say anything, she was gonna keep that for the rest of her life. Wow. They arrested a guy, and uh, it was another kid that was listening to the conversation. They, and he walked in the building right when uh, this was happening. And he was saying, yeah, somebody, he, was, he was telling another teacher, and they, they were all brought him in. So the, luckily the guy was arrested, but I know that I didn't see it. And she saw it based off just our confidence, just off noticing something was wrong, noticing it was not going to sit there and not say anything. So, 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 tell, me, so tell me about the program. How do, how do kids get involved? How, I mean, is it, is, it at, is it at your business? Is it at Fight Factory? Do you hold it there? Um, do you hold it at, you know, off-site if, if there are individuals that, that want to come? How do, who do they contact? If the, if the kids are um, in CCRC, um, parents are able just to contact CCRC and ask for me um, and my daycare, and they would be able to be able to get the uh, um, fight factory music, dance, all these different types of activities with no cost to the parents. Um, but it could be bigger, and all it, I think that what was needed was a simple letter from the city to CCRC regarding that what type of program this could be and benefit more kids. Every eight kids that go through Daddy's Daycare through CCRC allows one other kid that can't afford it for free. So all kids are not being left out. Um, there's enough money in CCRC to allow, and also other businesses will be affected by it. By more kids going through the program, I would have more kids being able to take the dance and the music and the arts. And these businesses that we have out here in Elma Valley is willing to even do a different background check. I've already talked to them. Different background check. The standards of a daycare. So parents understand that if your kid is going to this, this dance hall, they don't have X, Y, and Z working for them that has a background check that won't pass it in a daycare. But you have kids working there. You have right. kids coming there. You know, those type of things are not, I don't think, it's being addressed as well. Um, with kids going to these places that are providing businesses, um, I don't know if the background check is the same way as a daycare, that it could be. And that could be another way of finding out by even putting a stamp. I wanted to put a stamp on these certain businesses that was dealing with Daddy's Daycare as Daddy's Daycare approval, that they've been a background check. And we can have a Daddy Daycare sign on certain businesses 
that gives these parents a notification that these these back these businesses have been checked, and who's running the businesses are not, you know, out of the uh, out of the uh, prison or have a background of molesting kids. You know, that's I want to I want to thank you, Waki, for um, showing up. Um, I met this gentleman about two months ago, and he was collaborating with. Um, young lady who works for my company who will be here in a minute to uh, give a brief presentation. He didn't hesitate to allow us to use his facility to do a fundraiser for the expansion of our uh, nonprofit. And when I was there, I saw exactly what he's describing now, which is a program that is underutilized and underfunded, and it's one of the best kept secrets in our city. And I encourage all of my colleagues to make time out to go by the gym um, and take a look at what this um, gentleman is actually doing for these young people here in, in Lancaster and throughout the Antelope Valley. So I want to thank you for being here, man. Really do appreciate it. We have actually one other. We have a parent that actually wanted to say something that's consistent. I uh, one other quick question. Uh, what exactly is CCRC? I apologize. CCRC is a program that pays for child care. And all they really had to do was make me exempt. They made a couple of daycares in the valley exempt. And all they had to do was make me exempt. And I can be able to have as many kids that I can, we can uh, take care of to go through our program. And it's just a simple letter. It's nothing major. And the money's there. Daycares are, are sitting around collecting money on kids watching TV. Hmm. Um, same old, same old, every day. Um, best thing, too, I set this up with daycares. I challenged the daycares, so I wrote it up in a program for all daycares in Antelope Valley to program up, come and sign up with the after-school program to a lesser cost than what it would normally be. So if a daycare provider that's willing to put his mouth where his money is and pay $35 per kid a month, right. we'll provide that mixed martial arts service four days a week two different classes a day. Summertime, we have changed it from 12 to 4. So kids are not just sitting in the home watching cartoons all day. Kids have something to do and somewhere to go. So we will change hours as we need it to be changed for the after school, for summer program. That's already implemented. It's already started. So um, these letters, I've already got two daycares has already signed up with me. Um, they have four of their kids already in my after school program in a sense that they are there every day at the gym. And these kids are from 5 till, I think, 11 is the oldest one right now. And they're taking kickboxing, judo, um, Muay Thai, um, boxing. I teach the boxing. And we're, we added my wrestling. And just the confidence. I just cannot tell you the confidence. What you, when you give a kid confidence, you give a kid the ultimate reason to walk away. Walk away from unnecessary fights, walk away from guys talking, the gangs, everything. It's just simple confidence. And that's How big is your ring inside the facility? My bit, my ring? Yes. Oh, my ring is, is, is um, um, uh, amateur size ring. It's um, uh, U.S. approved the ring. It's probably one of the biggest rings in Antelope Valley. It's one of the, definitely the nicest rings. We are one of the largest gyms. This is how God just did. He just gave this to me. Um, I was, he gave it to me because giving up a boat or something like that is nothing compared to what can really happen here. So um, it's a blessing, and I want to thank um, record uh, Kelly Trees. I've been one of the biggest supporters of after school program. Um, very good man, very solid man. You have my commitment uh, that we will be working together. Okay, so. Okay. And I'm on record saying that. Thank you. I, I have a couple questions too, really quick, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, how do the kids get to the gym? I pick them up from the school um, and take them from the school to the gym. Okay. And she usually picks them up from the, uh, from the gym. And then uh, how many kids are enrolled right now then? Right now, um, it's through my daycare. Just from my daycare, this program through the gym that's paying for it. Is uh, I'm licensed for 14. That's I'm. It's not enough. Uh, I come out my pocket every month because of that's not enough. 
and just to simply making me exempt from licensing, which is CCRC is able to do, um, would have made this a lot easier. It would have made it a lot bigger by now. It would have touched a lot more kids by now. So a it's letter from the city would be helpful? A lot more city. You, you, you see the kids walking around these streets. You, you see they have nothing to do. And when you have nothing to do, you have kids that are pregnant by 15, 16 years old. You have kids in crime by 15, 16. Um, they're in the system. I've never been arrested. Don't plan to ever be. Never did no time in prison. My name is Kaimo Waukee Jones. Does not fit in prison. Does not fit in prison. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we, I'm really here to help. Well, uh, you gotta, you gotta forgive me in a sense of what, what is the exemption provide for you? I, I'm just, just not familiar. It provides me uh, um, to be able to take on as many kids as I can. Oh, so you're restricted to 14, and the exemption will allow you to take on more. Yes. Is, is that a state license? Is that? I'm a state, well, actually, CCRC, by writing their exemption, would actually, it would be through CCRC to just a grant an exemption. The state would be fine. That's not an issue with the state. Have they done um, that for other? Yes, uh, they have. Providers. They have done it for other daycares down in, Elmo, down in, uh, down in, the, down in um, San Fernando Valley. So, so you're exempted from the state license, is that it? it? What, you, what it is is this. When you become a center, there's certain things that you have to, have to be in a sense of building, quote, to be a center. You gotta have a location for the kids to be able to sleep in and to eat in. Since I don't qualify for that, I can't qualify the gym as a center, which it should be. It could be a boys and girls club. And that's how easy it would be for them just to um, make me exempt. I know they've done it for other other daycares down in Elmo Valley, I mean down in the uh, San Fernando Valley. Would it make you exempt from all the qualifications? In other words, being a center you would have to, I would, I would imagine you have to have a certain amount of bathroom space and things like that. Would that make, would, the, would that exempt you from that as well? No, safety issues would still be addressed. Um, the, the, the size of the building would still be addressed, adjust to how many kids you can take into any building. So it would just be how many kids I can take on at, at a certain time. So you're, you, you're using the Fight Factory as your, as your program headquarters, so to speak? In a sense, yes. But I also, I, I own a house where I have my daycare. A uh, large, nice house right off of um, um, Cedar and New Growth, um, where I have my daycare. But in order for it to be a center, I need to be able to have a location for the kids to sleep at and to eat at. Um, that doesn't qualify for the, the gym to be that way. Um, the gym could qualify as a, as a boys and girls club, which we have the same size room and bathrooms and capability that, that any other gym has or size-wise building would have. I, I'm, I'm a little confused. If you got the exemption, you would not have to provide a place for them to sleep? I would not have to. And those hours that, that are, that are the more useful, they need it, are actually used a lot, are after school. So when are they going to sleep? Okay. They're going to go from, from times they're getting picked up and their parents are picking them up at 6. So they're going to they're gonna go from 2.20 to maybe 6, 6.30. Would an exemption limit your hours then? It would not limit my hours. It, it would um, it would just give me more kids to be able to uh, give the service to. That's all it is. It's a very simple deal. I, w I w didn't understand why it was. I never even got a letter of why. It was just denied. And I, and I was told that it was given by the same person who denied me um, that it was given down in, in San Fernando Valley. And she couldn't re have a reason. She didn't understand why I was denied. She knew the program, and she loved the program. Lee, are you familiar with this stuff yeah, at all? C CCRC is a is a, a group that's affiliated and contracted to the County of Los Angeles for provide for child care providers. Right. And uh, the majority of that is for low income qualifiers based on child care needs and an assessment, and that the county issues it pays for the child care. Right. So their program is actually located over on 10th Street West here locally, um, and it's you, there's have they moved? They used to be on 10th West. So I think they just moved back from there. But it's a child care resource center, right? And so it's a group, and they've had been a long-term contract with Los Angeles County. So they actually provide funds for child care. So the exemption. Persons. So the exemption you're looking through, for is through their program to allow you to have more students. Well, yeah, allow me to have more students, um, and it just basically exempts me from 
the, the qualifications of a center of sleeping arrangements and feeding arrangements. That's all it does. It um, says, okay, you don't have these two things, but we're, we're still going to let you become a center. So is the license you're talking about, is that a Title 22 license? Is that what that is that you're trying to be exempted from? No. 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 Okay. It's, um, I will still have a state license. I'm just being exempt from the actual wording of having a center, of having a location where the kids sleep at and a location for the kids eat at. Which allows you to then go to CCRC to provide say, more than yes, 14 students. Right. I go to CCRC and say, hey, I'm a center because I have a sleeping arrangement and I have a feeding area. Um, and, now I, and then that I can become a center, which then I can take on 100 kids, 200 kids, whatever. And, but, and CCRC understands that your, your program is strictly an after school 2 to 6 or 2 to 7, 2 to 6 a program. They understood, yes, they understood that. It was, in, it was written in the wording of the letter. Um, I, that's why I could understand why it was denied. So once you got a letter of recommendation from various entities such as the City of Lancaster, then you would go to them in hopes of them granting you? Yes. Yes. Yes, definitely. Um, I think that would be it. I couldn't see why at that point, if the city's needing it and asking for it, why would this program not, not go? I mean, if, and plus, like I was saying, that every, out of every eight kids that are in through CCRC opens up another one for another kid to go through that can't afford it. So from, this is a program that's set up for low-income families that can actually help other kids that can't afford it as well. So there is a, essentially for, for those that, that don't qualify, there is a share of cost for the families? There is a share of cost in the sense, wait, say that one time. So, so if, if I wanted to send my, my daughter to your program, mm -hmm. um, would CCR pick up the bill? Would I have to pay if part you, of the bill? You would bill? have to qualify for CCRC to pay, to pay for your kids to okay. go in. You would have to qualify for that. But if you don't qualify for it, you would just pay for it, you know, like I have parents that pay cash. And then right. that and that would go against one of your 14 maximum. Are you are you? Uh, I'm sorry. I mean, are you just strictly restricted to 14 um, yes. CCRC? I'm restricted to 14 kids at one time. Okay. Uh, regardless of CCRC. Regardless of CCRC, okay. which is, you know, what, for what I have there, the size of the gym, and the, everything I have to offer for a, a program. Yeah, I'm, I'm restricted. How large is your building? The gym is, I want to say, about 6,000 square feet. Yeah, I wish I had which, pictures of which it. Which agency denied you? Um, CCRC denied. Oh, CCRC did. Yes. Okay. okay. Well, Key, if we had you come back or if you can get the city staff, whatever the literature is from CCRC for us to look at, I mean, I, you know, I, I think your program is fantastic. Um, you know, just, just so we understand what, what exactly the qualification is for the exemption, and then, you know, then we'll, t we'll take a look at it. I mean, I, you know, you know you, have you come back next month to our meeting, or in the meantime, we can do necessary investigations um, to look into the program. I mean, I think all of us um, are a little ignorant to, to what CCRC is, what the exemption is. Um, we're being educated on what you do. I just want to, you know, take a look it's at not, it's really, it's, it's really not that big of a deal in the sense of, of the um, asking for what they're, for getting um, the letter of um, not being a date or not being a center. The letter I need from them, they've already done it. It's not it, to them, even to them, it's not a big deal. That's why I can understand why they didn't make it happen. Even the lady that I sat down across with, she was thrown back that it was not approved. Um, was there an appeal process? There's no appeal process. Can you just you just reapply? You just reapply. So this time I wanted to. Is well, there is there an application? There's not an application. Just a letter you provide. Letter you provide is the service that you provide um, your kids and and why you. Why do you think that you should be exempt from um, the standards of a center? And when are you plan on uh, reapplying? Well, as soon as I get some letters. And you need so letters of support from yes, stakeholders. Yes, and sir. you saying the city would be a, a key. big okay. key to it. Big the whole application seems rather very vague. I'm, I'm really confused as to how the whole process works. When it comes down to what? To well, as far as there's no application. Yeah, there's no application. When it, well, 
when you first become a daycare, you, you have an application of your information that you give CCRC. But now when you're talking about being exempt as a center, no, there's no application. They just ask for a letter of why do you believe that you should be exempt from um, being a center because there's certain things that I, I can't provide sleeping arrangements inside the gym or eating arrangements, plus the kids are only there from 2 to 6. So that's why I really couldn't understand why they denied it because the stuff that they asked me to have, the kids won't use from 2 to 6. So it almost seems like it just you just need a grant writer that's going to word it properly. I mean, it, it seems really vague as to what they want from you. It's various. Most agencies like that will give you a list of what you have to do to qualify, and it's usually cut and dry. And in this case, you're saying it's not. There's no. There's no. They didn't give me a list of anything like that. They just gave me. They gave me the, the statement of saying what what makes you different from a center. What? Why do you? Why do you believe that you should be exempt? And these are the things I, I've told you why I believe I should be exempt, and they told me no. Now, I, I think it would be, you know, obviously we're, you know, we're here to, you know, as kind of a review process for, for different programs and things like that. I think, uh, Kelvin, can we have, set up a meeting for him to meet with your, your office? With what exactly, I mean, with, with what exactly he's looking for? Maybe show what he already brought in. Yeah, we'd be happy to meet with them and go over what documentation has and, and probably make some contacts and see where we can go with that. We'll, we'll need to evaluate it, definitely. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's why, that's why you know, Candid, I was just looking for, you know, for the, the backup, the application, you know, the literature. You know, you, with, most, with most government programs, anytime you go to apply for something, they give you a brochure that's this no thick. No application at all. So, you know, so that, that's, that's why, you know, with my background, I mean, doing a lot of work with nonprofits, you know, typically before you can scratch your head, you have to go through a form that's 20 right. pages long. No. Before you're saying the exemption is different. So what? You know, I'd like to to get you set up to have a meeting with uh, with the city manager's office and and look at what you're looking for. Let them do the investigation that they're required to do, and then um, if it's something we can uh, you know accomplish, then then we'll go from there. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Any, any other questions for Rocky? Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, our next presentation is from Commissioner Mohammed with the Helper Foundation. All right. You're going you're to take it from the podium, huh? Yeah, I'm going to take my commissioner hat off real quick so I can tune in to what I'm going to share. So I'm going to take off this commissioner hat and speak to my colleagues as the co-founder and executive director of the Helper Foundation. Um, the Helper Foundation was established uh, October 1999 in the city of Venice, California, where I grew up at. Um, the aim and purpose of the Helper Foundation was to basically deal with public safety issues that law enforcement was only dealing with it from a suppression standpoint. So at-risk youth, um, gang-involved youth, um, individuals who was um, being affected by violence, uh, the Helper Foundation was designed to begin to do prevention and intervention services to those families. Uh, Venice, uh, right now, if I mention that city to you, the first thing probably come to mind is the beach. But about a mile south of the beach, you had black and brown families who was there for about 100 plus years. Uh, my great great grandmother came in from Arkansas and, and settled there. However, by having black and brown families in one saturated community of about a mile and a half, when the drugs came in, violence came in. When the drugs came in, territory came in. And this was in the 70s. I'm just going all the way back. And what it created uh, was a divide between the black and brown community. Uh, in the early 90s, one of the worst gang wars that occurred in Los Angeles took place in Venice. And a lot of families was destroyed. A lot of individuals was killed. Um, and that brought rise to the Helper Foundation. And what our goal was at that time was to work with law enforcement from a prevention intervention standpoint. 
Uh, and we've been able to do that very successfully. So much so to where this is now about, what, 18 years later, uh, we're being funded by the city of Los Angeles, been funded for the past 10 years, not only to continue to impact the city of Venice with reduction in violence, but other parts of South Central Los Angeles. Uh, the reason why I thought it was important and imperative that you all know this type of work is occurring in L.A. is because we're now in the process of expanding these type of services to the Antelope Valley. Uh, over the past two years, we've been looking at what can we do to impact the at-risk community. And it boiled down to this. Uh, we know that a lot of young people is homeless right here in Antelope Valley. We know a lot of young people is on drugs right here in Antelope Valley. We know a lot of young people is on the borderline of being a full-fledged gang member, or if not currently a gang member right here in Antelope Valley. Uh, so what we decided to do is take our model, which is intervention from a, from a community standpoint, and narrow it down to residential treatment centers, to where we will be opening up a residential facility here in Lancaster to serve at-risk females first because what we're, find, what we're finding out is that there's a lot of services for the male gender as it relates to prevention and intervention services. But there's very limited, if any, services for young women who is either going through prostitution, drugs, may have a pimp in their life, definitely is affected by the environment in which they're growing up in. So the Helper Foundation is going to be opening up one of these type of facilities. After doing an assessment in Antelope Valley, although you have over 50 known street gangs in Antelope Valley, most of them is inactive. Uh, most of them, we hear from those individuals only when there is retaliation. Most of them is not aggressive. And what we're finding out is the ones that are aggressive, a lot of times the melees or the violence is occurring in South Central, but it comes back to the Antelope Valley in some kind of shape, fashion, or form. The bigger gangs in the Antelope Valley, most of them migrated from Los Angeles. And it's our responsibility through the Helper Foundation is to keep the network open because whenever there is an issue here and we know that there there's it's related to South Central, we can make a phone call to some of the ambassadors and some of the peacemakers that we have in LA to help us with issues up here in Antelope Valley. So about I would say about eighteen years ago, um, I co founded this company uh, and the passion for me was to give back to my neighborhood. Uh, I am a former member myself. I, uh, I don't hide it. I make it very known. Um, I'm a former um, drug user. I don't hide it. I make it known. Um, I spent time in federal prison. I don't hide it. I make it known. The reason why I don't hide it is because you're looking at an example of change. And if God can take a man like myself, without a prior education in this system that we call the LAUS school system. Didn't graduate from high school. Couldn't read, write, and spell growing up. Had an impediment. Couldn't speak to people. And this is the truth of the matter. So if God can take a man like me, 15 years of my life, drugs, gangs, violence, ultimately prison. But if he can take a man like me and change the attitude that I was having growing up, self-esteem, low, father, alcoholic, mother, great, streets, right there. And so if he can take somebody like me and change him, then anybody can change. And it's never too late. And that's what motivated me to start the Helper Foundation. And in doing so, I identified three other individuals that I used to hang out with. And I asked him when I came home from prison, will you guys help me change our community? And every one of them said, yeah, we'll help you, bro. And we went to work. And to this day, they're now saying the mayor 
came out and said that gang violence, youth violence, have not been this low since the early 70s. And the model that we created is now being recognized all over the country as a very successful model. So why am I saying this to my colleagues? Because oftentimes we sit amongst each other and we don't even really know each other. And it's very important that we know each other. If we're going to serve this community properly, we must get to know one another, period. This is why I asked Waikita to come out. And I'm going to introduce someone to you in a minute. That's the administrator and the representative for this area as it relates to our residential uh, facility that we're going to be opening. Um, I want to thank the mayor for recognizing in me uh, the leadership qualities because I was in a meeting one day with him and I shared this story with him. And he said, damn, looking at you, you would have never known it. I would love for you to meet up with some of my commissioners and become a commissioner. I said, well, okay, fine. Because at the end of the day, I'm going to stay grassrooted on the issues that is happening in our neighborhood. And Waukee is just one, but I'm going to be sending some more people to you. Because the more we get out there and begin to network, we begin to see programs as underutilized and underfunded. So the Helper Foundation stands for Help Establish Learning, Peace, Economics, and Righteousness. Our mission basically is to reduce violence and to help the public safety strategies that law enforcement have implemented. Uh, we have something in Los Angeles which we're going to be implementing here, which is called the Safe Passage Program. We've been trying to do this for a while, but we found out that the city don't have the necessary funding to do it, so we're going to leverage some of our relationships in entertainment and just really get the money. Safe Passages allows individuals to become community ambassadors. These individuals are special people, like myself. People who understand the language of a gang member. People who understand the language of a cat that want to be a gang member. People who understand the language of a bully. People who understand the language of somebody that just done lost their way. It's a language that's being spoken. And we have to understand it. So the Safe Passage Program is designed to help law enforcement and help administrations at school to identify before anything even occur who's really the one creating the havoc. And so for an example, Venice High, five years ago there was a murder on campus. Bill Rosenthal, which is the 11th District City Councilman, called me, said, Stan, I need you at that school, man. Okay, here's the money. Here's $100,000, Stan. I want you to put a team up there so this will never happen again. We took those resources, we identified individuals, we call them hood ambassadors, peace ambassadors. Former, in some cases, gang members. Trained through USC to be certified with the state of California to provide these type of services. We put a team up there. To this day, there have not been any type of violence on that level. And to this day, we was able to train the teachers and the administration. So now they're doing safe passages themselves. So we don't even need our guys up there no more. Why am I saying all this? Because, once again, it's vital that we get to know one another. Uh, I'm here in a suit and tie, but 20 years ago, I was somewhere getting high. And that's why God is real in my life. Some of us call him Jesus the Christ. Some of us call him Jehovah. Some of us call him Yahweh. But I'm a very spiritual man because without God being at the center, I wouldn't be standing in front of me right now. So with that being said, I wanted to go through these slides real quick, but I won't do that for the sake of time. I'm going to bring up a, a young lady who was introduced to me through my wife, and my wife and children is present, I think. By the way, she has her own daycare as well. <laughs> and I don't know how they do it. Why, well, I don't know how you do it. But you're better than me. But I met this young woman, and what I found out is she has a wealth of information as it relates to residential treatment, as it relates to understanding young women and the issues that they're going through right here in Lancaster. 
and I think she has over 15 years of experience as it relates to residential services. And the passion that she displayed at my home allowed me to say, you know what, you're the one for the job. We're going to put every resource we got behind you to open up this residential live-in treatment facility for these young women. So with that being said, with no further ado, and I want to thank my colleagues for listening to this, and it's a lot more, and that's why we got to have our tea lunches and our coffee breaks and our dinners, because we have to get to know one another. It's very important. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to bring up a young woman who is our administrator and our representative for the Helper Foundation, Ms. Jonay Jones. Now, in fact, let's give her a hand. <laughs> And can we bring up all the volunteers, because you guys in the back, these sisters actually volunteered at Rocky's location, our first fundraiser. And those funds that we raise is going to go to help us with the beds, uh, with the furniture in the house. And matter of fact, I'm going to let you take the mic up there. We only have about another five minutes. Thank you, guys. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jonay. Uh, a little bit about myself. I did graduate from Lancaster High School, the second graduating class. <laughs> And I graduated from Parkview. From then on, I went to CSUN, where I graduated with my degree in psychology. From there on, I went to work for a company called IABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, where I worked with autistic and emotionally disturbed children for a very long time. From there, I went to work for the Department of Defense, where I worked at Challenger as a teacher, as a substitute teacher. And then from there, I made my way to the wraparound team for Penny Lane and Valley Child Guidance. From there, I made my way to Macro Group Homes, where I found my passion and to celebrating women from all different walks of life. Because I had the experience to uh, use my knowledge from schools to work with all different caliber of women from, you know, private settings in the home, from being in a locked up facility, and to actually children who are caught in the middle of that. And what we wanted to do was to gear the residential program with the same passion and driven behind Brother um, Ansar's vision to the residential program and to revamp it. Everybody knows what a group home is and what it is and what it entails, but the programs are what we need to focus on. And the, what we did with this program that's coming to the Antelope Valley, we're trying to have the community where the kids don't feel like they are outcasts and they feel like to be misbehaved and the only where they found corroborate is in the court system. I run into several girls because we call it a revolving door because we see them either in court or out of court or in a home or in a new home. But that's the only place where they feel like they are have a place. Well, our programs are geared to show them that they have a place in the community. They have a place where we have to first work on their self-esteem and bridge the communication from the kids that don't necessarily live in that lifestyle and the kids that do. These are all volunteers that are graduated from Lancaster to AV and some there are actually going to AV college right now and we're actually working with them outside of the residential program that are not DCF children but as just community kids inside our community we do like you know a um, resume program and they come and they get the donations and they go load out the donations and they're passing out flyers because we want everyone to know even the girls that are going to be in the residential program that we are a community and no one is set aside so our programs are going to be geared to we work it on self-esteem we're going to actually have a, a counselor in there but every program was going to be geared to give them the tools that they have to sustain in community we all know that AB 12 has been extended and if you guys don't know that's where the foster children can now stay till I think of age of 22 because they're not ready and they don't have the skills that they're, they need when they get 18. And 18 is usually our cutoff ram for the children that are in Department of Children's Service. But me working there, they have nothing. They are walked out there in the cold and that's why we see the homeless growing. But the age are so young. I had a girl that was 11 and was homeless. So these kids are leaving the system because they don't have the nurturing that's supposed to be in the residential program instead of just giving room, board, and clothes and sending them on, they need to have a program that's geared for them. Most of these girls need to have a self-esteem workshop where we break it down and have an individual uh, application and we find out where their weakness is and we focus on those parts, you know. And we have another thing where we'll have the girls come in and be mentors. 
where they can have positive friendships, where they don't always have to feel like the person that's stealing and the person that is, you know, ditching and smoking weed are the friends that they need. We want to bridge the communication and the gap between the kids who feel that they're outcasts and their colleagues that they go to school with that they sit in the same desk with but don't feel that they're worthy enough. What we're trying to do is not just focus on giving them brush and comb and clothes. We're going to have all those things, but we're actually going to try to gear them so they can be ready to walk out in this community and actually feel good about themselves and have the tools to do those things as write a resume or, you know, have the confidence to get up and speak in front of a panel. And actually, we want to have all those programs that brother, the commissioner had told us about. We want to work together hand on hand with Lancaster because we do take them to outings in the community, but they always say, well, how can we work in there? They go to Farmer's Market, but they want to volunteer in Farmer's Market. They, they go up and down the boulevard that they love, but they don't know how to beautify it. Those are the things that we want to bridge the gap between residential program, where they feel like they're isolated, and put it back into a community-based program. And that's what we're trying to plan to do with the Helper Foundation community-based program. Question. Um, how long is your residential program? How long can these young ladies stay? Well, with the new AB 12 program, we're going to write it in and see if it is approved with the, um, you know, the state of California. If they will allow us to keep the child until the maximum age of AB 12, we are willing to stay that long. So right now, I think it's 22. Okay. So that is a little, but from there, we're working on other programs for transitional housing through Helper Foundation where that child, if they're not ready, if they're not going to college, and we can set them up into the transitional housing, and then they'll be in a separate step to get them to be independent living. I guess the only reason I'm asking is because, because of the extended um, stay, <laughs> yeah, not like the called. hotel, but I'm just <laughs> saying, uh, because, of, because of the age, I'm just wondering how, how will you deal with the capacity issue since Well, to answer that question, along. right now we're only uh, able to have six girls at a time. Okay. So once they are at six, then we would have to stay at six until a girl has graduated the program. See, we don't want the girls to be moved out of the program to go back to jail or things of that nature. Most of the times when a child is moved, or they go to jail, they usually lose their placement. What we're trying to do is do different, is we will work with that child to the end until they graduate sure. the program. You walk with them. Yeah, and walk with them all the way through. We're, it's, it's enough of letting them go, and once they go, all the work that you've done is gone because mm -hmm. you don't follow through. And we want to just change the program up and follow them all the way through so we will have graduations okay. instead of exiting now. And is there a component of... Family reunification. Absolutely. That absolutely is in the uh, program uh, statement where we would actually provide transportation to or from. We actually will have a counselor, excuse me, on staff that can actually, because most of the time what we come into a problem is working in that field is getting them to <coughs> the destination where they can both have conjoined therapy when they have family reunification. But if we have that on staff, that they can just come to the facility and do their visit in a private room with the therapist, mm -hmm. we were hoping for a better outcome so we won't have to have the communication or the, uh, you know, transportation. But if there are a child that lives in Los Angeles and say the mother is not mobile, then we have no problems with finding the services, working with the social workers that around the area and commuting, the, taking the child, transporting the child to there and back. And that would be written in our program statement to say that we are going to allow our staff to transport the child to their therapy with their parents. Because what we want to do is actually, we want to bridge it all the way together where because what happens is if we get a child, and if anybody is you know familiar with this area, most of our kids are coming from the Los Angeles area, greatly. But when we say um, uh, family reunification, the parent may not have ever driven, have m no education, can't read the manual, so then there goes that. So when we go to court, no mom, no dad, next. So we're trying to change those things by transporting the child and the mother to their therapy. Thank you. Do you have a specific curriculum or something that you're going to use? 
absolutely. We actually have a program statement that is about this wide to <laughs> this big to show all the things in great detail because every program had to be designed and written out in great detail to present to the state of California. So the curriculum that they need to, there is that there is absolutely a, a level of expectation of the children, which we're trying to change from what you will usually see, which is room and board, we do have an expectation to stay in the program for a level system. So you have to maintain so many, you know, points to stay in this because this is not going to be like a, a quote unquote everyday group home. This is going to be a chance to walk with you to the end, you know, scholarships and making sure that they get into those classes and, you know, a little bit like 10% more that push that some of these kids, well, all of them meet. All of them need. So, yes, absolutely. And this will be a state licensed facility? Yes, absolutely. How far, how far away are you to opening? We are very, very, very close. Thank you, Jesus. It's been a very long process. We are at the end stage because, you know, this the, the language has to be written correctly. So we are in the end stages to getting that back. And once we do that, we can submit. And after that, we're waiting on the fire marshals, and we're on our way. How long have you been working on this? Uh, a year. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Any other questions? Stan, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this group up here. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, for our last presentation of the day, we have uh, Asmopolis or Asmapolis or <laughs> whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Welcome, Patty. I think it's Asmopolis. Asmopolis. See, I, I say mop and they say map. I'm going to call it Asmopolis forever. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, commissioners. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to provide an update on our successful Asmopolis meeting that we had on May 15th. We had over 30 um, different participants. Some of you also participated in that event. Um, we had a lot of really good turnout from the medical community. We had doctors there, medical administrators, representation from Kaiser Permanente, Hydrazer Medical Group, Antelope Valley Hospital, even um, Antelope Valley Community Clinic. Um, as you know, the staff from Esmopolis was there to answer questions about their program. They kind of went through what it's about for all the people that were unfamiliar with it. They actually did demonstrations with their device to, um, to educate people and to show them how, you know, their device connects with an inhaler, how it works, what it does. Um, they even walked us through, you know, how a patient would actually log into their account online and see, you know, how um, something as simple as the weather might affect their asthma for that day. So it was a really interesting presentation. Um, the most valuable part of the meeting, I'm sure you guys would all agree, was all the great input that we got from all of our doctors. Um, they were really helpful in educating us in um, you know what they see as far as practitioners um, with asthma and um, you know they're actually out in the community and and deal with this every day they really understand that this really is an epidemic that we're facing here it's not just asthma it's, it's really a problem that we're having um, you know it's something that really takes a lot of our resources and um, and uses put puts them through uh, or puts them to use through asthma which you know if, if we could control it through a program like Asmopolis we could use those resources for something else so they really saw the value of the program um, we plan to continue Excuse me. We plan to continue our conversation about Asmopolis. Um, we're actually having a meeting on July 2nd, which um, we're uh, inviting all of those medical practitioners who came to our initial meeting to. We're also hoping to invite um, some of our uh, doctors who were unable to attend but definitely express an interest in the meeting. Um, and then we also now have a different group of, um, of practitioners who were um, recommended by some of our doctors, and they're recommended based on the fact that they work with the community, they work with asthma, they have some um, expertise in that area. Um, what we're hoping to do through this meeting is obviously to talk about, you know, how we get started uh, because we all have great ideas, but we, we really want to make sure that we get started on the right foot, that we, um, that we understand what we're getting ourselves into, that we have the right people in place, the right things in place, um, you know, that we get everybody on board that we need. We're hoping to get everyone who was present there, you know, Kaiser Permanente, High Desert Medical Group, all those guys on board. So how do we make that happen? Those are the conversations that we hope to start at that meeting. Um, we also hope to talk about how we use our existing resources. We have a wonderful resource through our wellness homes, um, and we hope to use that as part of the Asmopolis um, program. And so we, we're going to talk about those different things. Um, obviously, Asmopolis staff, because they are the experts in this whole thing, uh, will be present for that meeting. They'll kind of, again, go over you know, their best practices, what they think, how they think we should get started, who we should have involved. Um, and they'll also be with us throughout the year-long process. Kelvin is actually working on a contract with them right now, um, which will you know, talk about all the detail and all the things that they'll be involved in. Obviously, um, once we get people signed up for the program, we need to make sure that somebody's there to 
serve as customer service and, and talk to all of our patients when they have questions about the program. And so those are some of the details that Calvin's working on right now with staff from Asmopolis. Um, it's really exciting to see this program come together. I know we've talked about it for such a long time, and now it's finally, finally coming together. Um, we're really grateful for all of your support um, that you've given us through the program. You guys have really connected us with the right people. Um, you were really good in getting everybody excited at that initial meeting, and um, it's really going to be a very good thing for the community. So we're really excited, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Is there an actual meeting date? I'm yes, I'm sorry. It's July 2nd. That's our initial meeting. It's our normal normal meeting. It's time. our normal meeting. Okay. So what we're doing is we're calling it a working session, which it will be. Um, so instead of our, having this meeting, we're going to meet over at the Museum of Art and History in the Lantern. We're going to set it up in a you know um, in a conference style so that we can all talk and kind of debrief. Same time, four o'clock. Yeah, we the city staff and I have been working to to get basically letters and, and mm -hmm. invitations and things out to the various different members of the community to try to get them involved to come to this so that we can hear you know some more than what we heard um, at, the, at, the, at the luncheon so we can get an idea you know now they've kind of they've been briefed so now how will this work mm -hmm. you know how can you be involved you know how you know it's 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 we, we, we need some cooperation the city can't do it by itself because we we don't have Initially, don't have the resources, and additionally, we don't have the access to the to the information and the patients and all the other things that that are, that are there. So we're asking the hospitals and the you know high desert medical groups and the Kaisers and you know ABPH and everyone to, to come and be involved with this, um, so that we can see that these Asmopolis people really know what they're talking about. <laughs> And we're hoping, you know, through that one-year project that we, um, you know, that everybody will really see the benefit and that we see some actual numbers. And, you know, the, the numbers of people who go to the ER because of asthma-related issues drops. And so we see the benefit and we can continue the program after that. I, I, spoke, with, I spoke with one of the, the doctors from the Emma Valley Emergency Medical Associates who, who, who are the ER doctors. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of posed some of these questions. He, was in a, he didn't go to the meeting, the luncheon. I'm getting one of their representatives will be there, so I'll, I'll get you that information, Patty. But they, you know, I asked them, generally speaking, you know, how, you know whether or not they felt there was a need for this, and without a doubt there is. I mean, it's, you know, I, I kind of share a little story. The day I was in the ER with my appendix bursting, which I think is a pretty high-priority thing, this, this, uh, this, this young adolescent boy walked in and, you know, he couldn't breathe. He got priority, no doubt about it. So and I, I don't have a problem with that, of course. Um, you know, but, but bottom line is, is that you, you know how important it is because, you know, you have, you know, obviously it's the, the, it's the main thing you need to stay alive is to breathe. And, you know, I think, Patty, you're asthmatic, if I, I remember. So, I so you understand. Absolutely. So let's, you know, let's see what we could do. And, you know, I, I'm looking forward to the next meeting. You know, I think, you know, it's good to kind of, kind of have a good session so it'll work out I would love to definitely participate because uh, I grew up with asthma and it's, 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 it's a terrible feeling scary thing somehow I grew out of it I mean I still deal with sinuses now but the asthma I don't have and I don't know if it's due to um, just growing out of it but I remember some of the worstest medicine I ever took was called three sixes. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but it was yellow. It was sold. It was um, over the counter, and it was six six six. It was so you never heard of that, huh? It was so powerful. My mother, I would have to take something after it. Um, yeah, three sixes, man. Wow, terrible. But yes, yeah, a terrible feeling. So I'm, I'm hoping to get some good good response from this. So Absolutely. thank you, Patty. Sure. And thank you're you. also here. You might as well stay up there. Give us an update <laughs> update on, on, on Unite and how we're doing with the program Absolutely. for this year. We're doing really great on the Unite program. Um, we actually, our program deadline is this Friday. We've had a lot of wonderful turnout. Um, really appreciate, thank you, Commissioner Muhammad, for coming out to one of our presentations and getting people excited about the program. We've had two informational meetings, which are um, Safer Starving Neighborhoods Committee um, put together and hosted, and they were really great. Um, again, people were coming out to ask questions, to find out how they apply, and um, so it's been a really good positive turnout. Like I said, our application deadline is this Friday, and I just want to encourage the community to continue applying for it. It's such a wonderful program. It's a wonderful opportunity. Um, if you see anything in your neighborhood that needs to be fixed, something that you can you know, put some paint over that would make the um, 
make a significant difference in your community, this is a program for you. Um, you know, it, and it doesn't have to just necessarily be a beautification <coughs> program. If you just want to, you know, put together a community barbecue in your neighborhood with your neighbors because you don't know each other now and you want to know each other, you can do that. I mean, we really are, um, you know, we're asking for creativity and for different things, but something as simple as a neighborhood barbecue would work as well. Um, application we've done that in the past. We've done it in the past, and it's worked out really well. We've had small ones, big ones, all size. Um, Applications are available here on, uh, at Lancaster City Hall. We're also available online. People can feel free to call me directly at City Hall. Um, I'm in the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, they can also contact us via our um, email address, which is just in unite at cityoflancasterca.org. Um, as far as next steps with the program, we're accepting applications till Friday, like I said, but after that we'll start doing our review process, which all of our commissioners we, will be involved with, um, as well as our Safer Sorry Neighborhoods Committee. We'll go through applications, kind of see what we you know, what we have, um, we'll rate all of our different applications, and then um, hopefully in August at our commission uh, meeting, we'll go ahead and announce our winners, have them come out and actually present their project, and uh, just get everybody excited for project date, which is September 21st this year. So Waukee can apply, he, he's, uh, he's eligible. Any okay. community program, any, any organization, or just neighborhood group can And apply. it would be a conflict of interest if the Helper Foundation applied, correct? Mm, I don't see why. Probably. Well, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Well, I won't. I won't even tread. Because you apply doesn't mean you get picked, though. So I won't tread. I won't tread because I'm gonna be asking for favors. So I won't even tread. But I think Waukee would be a good. Um, well, you only have until Friday, bro, yeah. to, to get that application in that I gave you. Yeah. yeah. And um, for more information, also for anybody that's watching this. Um, this council or commission meeting, sorry, um, city city of Lancaster. On our website, we actually have a Unite Lancaster page, which tells you all the program details, um, how we score our applications, and everything else you want to know about about uh, applying for Unite. So, very exciting pro program. Our fourth year, and we're hoping it's the best one yet. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brenda, Brenda, how's the city doing? Give us the update. The city is doing great. The air conditioner works far better in here than it does in my office. I'm not sweating anymore. Oh, your nice new building, huh? No, right? What are they doing? Oh. It was 87 degrees while I walked out of there today. Wow. So I hope the landlord is watching. <laughs> Anyways, Brenda, tell us, tell us what's going on. Well, if you do enjoy the heat, <laughs> um, this Thursday at the Farmer's Market, we've started the Toyota Concert Series. So this Thursday is Latin Flair. So Caravana is playing on Beck's stage. Nice and enjoyment there. Um, and you can get your healthy vegetables and fruits. And then the LPAC Foundation Gala and Ground Auction is this Saturday. So come on out to that, too, and support the LPAC Foundation. I'm going to stop you for a second, Brenda. Those who don't know, I, I'm also the vice president of the LPAC Foundation. Um, the, the, what we do f for the LPAC, I don't think many people know, and it's, we do v very little for the LPAC and more for the community. We fund the biggest thing that's my passion is the Arts for Youth program. We, all the students from public, private, you know, small charter schools, we bring them in, we bust them in so that they can experience a performance in a theater, something that the schools can't pay for anymore. I and mean, we raise thousands of dollars a year, and this event on Saturday is our main event. This is how we continue to fund this program to bring the kids out. So it's $100 per person. Um, we have 30 grand auction items, everything from trips to Costa Rica, and these are you know, all-inclusive, airfare-included auction items that are just really Hawaii, anything you can think of, trips for the families, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's really you know, a, a Botox package, you know, I don't know about that, <laughs> but I mean, we have pretty much everything, and I mean, we're going to raise, a, you know, we're looking to raise a, you know, a, a ton of money on Saturday. Mm -hmm. It's a casual beach theme. So, you know, bring out your, you know, a Kelvin shirt would be perfect. He fits in today. Bring your Hawaiian shirt and, you know, girls wear your, wear your dresses and UAV is, is, is going to be catering the event. Um, and, and Gino's is providing um, the, the cocktails and drinks. And it's, it's just really a great night. We've got bands. Experience the theater the way you should. Um, anyways, I'm, I'm excited about it. So if anyone needs tickets, please let me know. I've got, I've got them. So. And this annual event? It's an annual event. It's our third one. Um, it's, you know, so we're still new at it, but I think we're, they're getting better. And this one, we're real, I mean, we've, been, we've spent all year, the last 12 months, really planning for this. Um, 
you know, and it's it, there's you know, if just for just to have, come and have a good time and support the cause, um, it's a great great event. So, sorry, Brenda, I jumped that's, all over you. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> you did a much better better presentation. Um, June fifteenth is save the date for the first annual Lancaster Jazz Festival at the fairgrounds too. So we've got lots of arts and entertainment and healthy activities coming up. And our event season is starting um, in September, August, September. So look forward to that. And then just another note, since um, we are very interested in the health of, of our citizens in the community, I attended a Heal Zone meeting today and was informed by our um, county public health representative that there is a health warning for uh, frozen berries that you can get from Costco or have gotten from Costco. It's Townsend is the brand. So if you Townsend, it's the organic um, mixed berries, frozen berries. And um, they're predominantly out of Costco too, aren't they? Correct. So if you have those in your freezer, please do not eat them. Throw them out. Um, it's a hepatitis A scare, so go to your doctor. <laughs> do Jabba Juice, do they use those berries from Costco's, I'm um, No, they're, no, the, no. I don't think so. No, they, they, yeah. they, have, to, they, have, to, they have to provide um, distributors from a, like oh. a Cisco or something, so. That's maybe. my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Brenda, I just wanted to say thunder on the lots this weekend also for kids' charities, so. After the gala, and, or before the gala, or before the exactly. gala, or on Sunday, go to uh, Thunder on the Lot. Thunder, Thunder on the Lot is both right. both Saturday and Sunday. Another great another great event. We didn't plan it purposely on the same weekend, and uh, and it is what it is. But it's going to be a fun fun weekend. So, right, and then stay out of the ashes. <laughs> the smoke is starting to go away. Yes. Perfect. Thank you, Brenda. Um, any speaker cards for non agendized items? No, sir. Okay. Any commissioner comments today? I want to thank Waki and his uh, team for being present. I'm looking forward to working with you very closely um, as we develop what's needed to make sure that you can get that exempt status. I want to thank my colleagues for allowing me to come and present um, the Helper Foundation. I'm looking forward to not only continuing um, as a commissioner, but to get to know you all. I think that's you know something that I need to do is find out who am I serving. I mean, who am I dealing with and talking to and serving with as it relates to our community. I'm going to be um, on the ground, and on behalf of this commission, I think that's why the mayor identified me. I'm going to stay grounded to the community. And I will be inviting um, directors and founders and people to come present. And one of these days, my goal is to have this place packed because you guys is, man, this is all volunteer. People need to know. Look at the empty seats. People need to know that this is commission is here to revitalize the Lancaster community, man. And I'm pumped up. So you'll be hearing a lot more from me. Thank we, you. We appreciate it. Um, yeah, Waukee, thank you. And, and to, to your team here, these young kids, and you guys are the best behaved couple of sleepers here in the front row. <laughs> but that, that's, I, that's okay. I probably would do the same thing. So th thank, you for, thank you for that. And I, I imagine that's because uh, you got them so well trained over at the Fight Factory. So. Fantastic. Thank you so much again, Waukee. Okay, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting at it is 525.